Chapter Twelve of Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Twelve, quite a sentimental chapter. We must now take leave of Arcadia, and those amiable people practising the rural virtues there, and travel back to London to inquire what has become of Miss Amelia. We don't care a fig for her, writes some unknown correspondent, with a pretty little handwriting and a pink seal to her note. She is faded and insipid, and adds some more kind remarks to this strain, which I should never have repeated at all, but that they are, in truth, prodigiously complimentary to the young lady whom they concern. Has the beloved reader in his experience of society never heard similar remarks by good-natured female friends who always wonder what you can see in miss smith that is so fascinating or what could induce major jones to propose for that silly insignificant simpering miss thompson who has nothing but her wax doll face to recommend her what is there in a pair of pink cheeks and blue eyes forsooth these dear moralists ask and hint wisely that the gifts of genius the accomplishments of the mind the mastery of magnol's questions and a ladylike knowledge of botany and geology the knack for making poetry the power of rattling sonatas in the hertz manner and so forth are far more valuable endowments for a female than those fugitive charms which a few years will inevitably tarnish it is quite edifying to hear women speculate upon the worthlessness and the duration of beauty but though virtue is a much finer thing and those hapless creatures who suffer under the misfortune of good looks ought to be continually put in mind of the fate which awaits them and though very likely the heroic female character which ladies admire is a more glorious and beautiful object than the kind fresh smiling artless tender little domestic goddess whom men are inclined to worship yet the latter and inferior sort of woman must have this consolation that the men do admire them after all and that in spite of all our kind friends warnings and protests we go on in our desperate error and folly and shall to the end of the chapter indeed for my own part though i have been repeatedly told by persons for whom i have the greatest respect that miss brown is an insignificant chit and mrs white has nothing more but her petit minois chiffon and mrs black has not a word to say for herself yet i know that i have had the most delightful conversations with mrs black of course my dear madam they are inviolable I see all the men in a cluster round Mrs. White's chair, all the young fellows battling to dance with Miss Brown, and so I am tempted to think that to be despised by her sex is a very great compliment to a woman. The young ladies in Amelia's society did this for her very satisfactorily. For instance, there was scarcely any point upon which the Misses Osborne, George's sisters, and the Mesdemoiselles Dobbin agreed so well as in their estimate of her very trifling merits, and their wonder that their brothers could find any charms in her. "'We are kind to her,' the Misses Osborne said, a pair of fine black-browed young ladies, who had the best of governesses, masters, and milliners and they treated her with such extreme kindness and condescension and patronised her so insufferably that the poor little thing was in fact perfectly dumb in their presence and to all outward appearance as stupid as they thought her she made efforts to like them as in duty bound and as sisters of her future husband she passed long mornings with them the most dreary and serious of forenoons she drove out solemnly in their great family coach with them and miss wirt their governess that raw-boned vestal 
they took her to the ancient concerts by way of a treat and to the oratorio and to st paul's to see the charity children where in such terror was she of her friends she almost did not dare be affected by the hymn the children sang their house was comfortable their papa's table rich and handsome their society solemn and genteel and their self-respect prodigious they had the best pew at the foundling all their habits were pompous and orderly and all their amusements intolerably dull and decorous after every one of her visits and oh how glad she was when they were over miss osborne and miss maria osborne and miss wirt the vestal governess asked each other with increased wonder what could george find in that creature how is this some carping reader exclaims how is it that amelia who had such a number of friends at school and was so beloved there comes out into the world and is spurned by her discriminating sex my dear sir there were no men at miss pinkerton's establishment except the old dancing-master and you would not have had the girls fall out about him when george their handsome brother ran off directly after breakfast and dined from home half a dozen times a week no wonder the neglected sisters felt a little vexation when young bullock of the firm of hulker bullock and company bankers lombard street who had been making up to miss maria the last two seasons actually asked amelia to dance the cotillion could you expect that the former young lady should be pleased and yet she said she was like an artless forgiving creature i'm so delighted you like dear amelia she said quite eagerly to mr bullock after the dance she's engaged to my brother george there's not much in her but she's the best-natured and most unaffected young creature at home we're all so fond of her dear girl who can calculate the depth of affection expressed in that enthusiastic so miss wirt and these two affectionate young women so earnestly and frequently impressed upon george osborne's mind the enormity of the sacrifice he was making and his romantic generosity in throwing himself away upon amelia that i'm not sure but that he really thought he was one of the most deserving characters in the british army and gave himself up to be loved with a good deal of easy resignation somehow although he left home every morning as was stated and dined abroad six days in the week when his sisters believed the infatuated youth to be at miss sedley's apron-strings he was not always with amelia whilst the world supposed him at her feet certain it is that on more occasions than one when captain dobbin called to look for his friend miss osborne who was very attentive to the captain and anxious to hear his military stories and to know about the health of his dear mamma would laughingly point to the opposite side of the square and say oh you must go to the sedleys to ask for george we never see him from morning till night at which kind of speech the captain would laugh in rather an absurd constrained manner and turn off the conversation like a consummate man of the world to some topic of general interest such as the opera the prince's last ball at carlton house or the weather that blessing to society what an innocent it is that pet of yours miss maria would then say to miss jane upon the captain's departure did you see how he blushed at the mention of poor george on duty it's a pity if frederick bullock hadn't some of his modesty maria replies the elder sister with a toss of her head modesty awkwardness you mean jane i don't want frederick to trample a hole in my muslin frock as captain dobbin did in yours at miss perkins's in your frock <laughs> how could he wasn't he dancing with amelia the fact is when captain dobbin blushed so and looked so awkward he remembered a circumstance of which he did not think it was necessary to inform the young ladies viz that he had been calling at mr sedley's house already 
on the pretence of seeing George, of course, and George wasn't there. Only poor little Amelia, with rather a sad, wistful face, seated near the drawing-room window, who, after some very trifling, stupid talk, ventured to ask, was there any truth in the report that the regiment was soon to be ordered abroad, and had Captain Dobbins seen Mr. Osborne that day? The regiment was not ordered abroad as yet, and Captain Dobbin had not seen George. He was with his sister, most likely, the captain said. Should he go and fetch the truant? So she gave him her hand, kindly and gratefully, and he crossed the square, and she waited and waited, but George never came. Poor little tender heart! And so it goes on, hoping and beating and longing and trusting. You see, it is not much of a life to describe. There is not much of what you call incident in it. Only one feeling all day. When will he come? Only one thought to sleep and wake upon. I believe George was playing billiards with Captain Cannon in Swallow Street at the time when Amelia was asking Captain Dobbin about him, for George was a jolly, sociable fellow, and excellent in all games of skill. Once, after three days of absence, Miss Amelia put on her bonnet, and actually invaded the Osborne house. "'What? Leave our brother to come to us,' said the young ladies. "'Have you had a quarrel, Amelia? Do tell us.' "'No, indeed there had been no quarrel. "'Who could quarrel with him?' says she, with her eyes filled with tears. "'She only came over to, to see her dear friends. They had not met for so long.' and this day she was so perfectly stupid and awkward that the Misses Osborne and their governess, who stared after her as she went sadly away, wondered more than ever what George could see in poor little Amelia. Of course they did. How was she to bear that timid little heart for the inspection of those young ladies with their bold black eyes? it was best that it should shrink and hide itself. I know the Misses Osborne were excellent critics of a cashmere shawl or a pink satin slip, and when Miss Turner had hers dyed purple and made into a spencer, and when Miss Pickford had her ermine tippet twisted into a muff and trimmings, I warrant you the changes did not escape the two intelligent young women before mentioned. But there are things, look you, of a finer texture than fur or satin and all solomon's glories and all the wardrobe of the queen of sheba things whereof the beauty escapes the eyes of many connoisseurs and there are sweet modest little souls on which you light fragrant and blooming tenderly in quiet shady places and there are garden ornaments as big as brass warming-pans that are fit to stare the sun itself out of countenance. Miss Sedley was not of the sunflower sort, and I say it is out of the rules of all proportion to draw a violet of the size of a double dahlia. No, indeed, the life of a good young girl, who is in the paternal nest as yet, can't have many of those thrilling incidents to which the heroine of romance commonly lays claim. Snares or shot may take off the old birds foraging without. Hawks may be abroad from which they escape or by whom they suffer. But the young ones in the nest have a pretty comfortable, unromantic sort of existence in the down and the straw. Till it comes to their turn, too, to get on the wing while becky sharp was on her own wing in the country hopping on all sorts of twigs and amid a multiplicity of traps and pecking up her food quite harmless and successful amelia lay snug in her home of russell square if she went into the world it was under the guidance of the elders nor did it seem that any evil could befall her or that opulent, cheery, comfortable home in which she affectionately sheltered. Mamma had her morning duties and her daily drive, and the delightful round of visits and shopping, 
which forms the amusement or the profession as you may call it of the rich london lady pa conducted his mysterious operations in the city a stirring place in those days when war was raging all over europe and empires were being staked when the courier newspaper had tens of thousands of subscribers when one day brought you a battle of vittoria another a burning of moscow or a newsman's horn blowing down russell square about dinner-time announced such a fact as battle of leipzig six hundred thousand men engaged total defeat of the french two hundred thousand killed old sedley once or twice came home with a very grave face and no wonder when such news as this was agitating all the hearts and all the stocks of europe meanwhile matters went on in russell square bloomsbury just as if matters in europe were not in the least disorganised the retreat from leipzig made no difference in the number of meals mr sambo took in the servants hall the allies poured into france and the dinner-bell rang at five o'clock just as usual i don't think poor amelia cared anything about brienne and montmirail or was fairly interested in the war until the abdication of the emperor when she clapped her hands and said prayers oh how grateful and flung herself into george osborne's arms with all her soul to the astonishment of everybody who witnessed that ebullition of sentiment the fact is peace was declared europe was going to be at rest the corsican was overthrown and lieutenant osborne's regiment would not be ordered on service that was the way in which miss amelia reasoned the fate of europe was lieutenant george osborne to her his dangers being over she sang te deum he was her europe her emperor her allied monarchs and august prince regent he was her sun and moon and i believe she thought the grand illumination and ball at the mansion house given to the sovereigns were especially in honour of george osborne we have talked of shift self and poverty as those dismal instructors under whom poor miss becky sharp got her education now love was miss amelia sedley's last tutoress and it was amazing what progress our young lady made under that popular teacher in the course of fifteen or eighteen months daily and constant attention to this eminent finishing governess what a deal of secrets amelia learned which miss wirt and the black-eyed young ladies over the way which old miss pinkerton of chiswick herself had no cognizance of as indeed how should any of those prim and reputable virgins with mrs p and w the tender passion is out of the question i would not dare to breathe such an idea regarding them miss maria osborne it is true was attached to mr frederick augustus bullock of the firm of hulker bullock and bullock but hers was a most respectable attachment and she would have taken bullock senior just the same her mind being fixed as that of a well-bred young woman should be upon a house in park lane a country house at wimbledon a handsome chariot and two prodigious tall horses and footmen and a fourth of the annual profits of the eminent firm of hulker and bullock all of which advantages were represented in the person of frederick augustus had orange blossoms been invented then those touching emblems of female purity imported by us from france where people's daughters are universally sold in marriage miss maria i say would have assumed the spotless wreath and stepped into the travelling carriage by the side of gouty old bald-headed bottle-nosed bullock senior and devoted her beautiful existence to his happiness with perfect modesty only the old gentleman was married already so she bestowed her young affections on the junior partner sweet blooming orange flowers the other day i saw miss trotter that was arrayed in them trip into the travelling carriage at st george's hanover square and lord methuselah 
hobbled in after with what an engaging modesty she pulled down the blinds of the chariot the dear innocent there were half the carriages of vanity fair at the wedding this was not the sort of love that finished amelia's education and in the course of a year turned a good young girl into a good young woman to be a good wife presently when the happy time should come this young person perhaps it was very imprudent in her parents to encourage her and abet her in such idolatry and silly romantic ideas loved with all her heart the young officer in his majesty's service with whom we have made a brief acquaintance she thought about him the very first moment on waking and his was the very last name mentioned in her prayers she never had seen a man so beautiful or so clever such a figure on horseback such a dancer such a hero in general talk of the prince's bow what was it to george's she had seen mr brummel whom everybody praised so compare such a person as that to her george not amongst all the bow at the opera and there were bow in those days with actual opera hats was there any one to equal him he was only good enough to be a fairy prince and oh what magnanimity to stoop to such a humble cinderella miss pinkerton would have tried to check this blind devotion very likely had she been amelia's confidant but not with much success depend upon it it is in the nature and instinct of some women some are made to scheme and some to love and i wish any respected bachelor that reads this may take the sort that best likes him while under this overpowering impression miss amelia neglected her twelve dear friends at chiswick most cruelly as such selfish people commonly will do she had but this subject of course to think about and miss saltire was too cold for a confidant and she couldn't bring her mind to tell miss swartz the woolly-haired young heiress from st kitts she had little laura martin home for the holidays and my belief is she made a confidant of her and promised that laura should come and live with her when she was married and gave laura a great deal of information regarding the passion of love which must have been singularly useful and novel to that little person alas alas i fear poor emmy had not a well-regulated mind what were her parents doing not to keep this little heart from beating so fast old sedley did not seem much to notice matters he was graver of late and his city affairs absorbed him mrs sedley was of so easy and uninquisitive a nature that she wasn't even jealous mr jos was away being besieged by an irish widow in cheltenham amelia had the house to herself ah too much to herself sometimes not that she ever doubted for to be sure george must be at the horse guards and he can't always get leave from chatham and he must see his friends and sisters and mingle in society when in town he such an ornament to every society and when he is with the regiment he is too tired to write long letters i know where she kept that packet she had and can steal in and out of her chamber like yakimo like yakimo no that is a bad part i will only act moonshine and peep harmless into the bed where faith and beauty and innocence lie dreaming but if mr osborne's were short and soldier-like letters it must be confessed that were miss sedley's letters to mr osborne to be published we should have to extend this novel to such a multiplicity of volumes as not the most sentimental reader could support that she not only filled sheets of large paper but crossed them with the most astonishing perverseness that she wrote whole pages out of poetry books without the least pity that she underlined words and passages with quite a frantic emphasis and in fine gave the usual tokens of her condition she wasn't a heroine 
her letters were full of repetition she wrote rather doubtful grammar sometimes and in her verses took all sorts of liberties with the metre but oh mesdames if you are not allowed to touch the heart sometimes in spite of syntax and are not to be loved until you know the difference between trimeter and tetrameter may all poetry go to the deuce and every schoolmaster perish miserably End of chapter twelve